All right, so um, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2, I guess. We'll figure something out. No, I think I told you maybe last week, maybe the week before, that I actually approached this part of it maybe kind of backwards. Uh, I talked about fellowship, I talked about the unity, I talked about the one accord, uh, when I began to talk about them gathering and how they were being the church. And then last week, I talked about some of those different marks of the church, uh, about how you become uh, a follower of Christ, and then, and then what the, how the church acts there in about verse 42, or verse 40, uh, and following, and who the church is. And really, none of this is possible aside from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So um, really, uh, Acts chapter 2 uh, and verse 1 is really a key component. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then to skip over to... Uh, Verse 38, which is a verse that I really kind of drove home. I drove home part of it uh, last week uh, after the people were convicted of their sins. You know, Peter, after the filling of the Holy Spirit from when we just read, Peter got up and he preached a sermon. Uh, people were uh, convicted in their hearts and they wanted to know what, what, they, what they should do. And in verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he told them, uh, you need to turn your life to God. You need to stop following your own ways. You need to stop following your own desires. You need to stop following yourself. And you need to turn your life and begin to follow after God. Begin to seek after the things of God. Uh, begin to... Uh, Put your focus upon God and His purposes and make them the priority of life, of your life. And when you do that, he says, then you're going to be baptized in the name of Jesus and you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So um, I really don't... Uh I really, I really don't want to. I really don't want to talk about baptism here, but because it's in that verse, I just have to at least just say this. Because they ask him, "What do we do?" and he says, "Repent." Uh, and then he says, "And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ." So uh, you you might have this misunderstanding that baptism is necessary for salvation, which it's not. If you looked over by chance at ten, chapter ten, verse forty six, um, this is when Peter had gone to Cornelius' house. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. They all received the Holy Spirit before they were ever baptized. In fact, while Paul was still sharing with them and still talking to them, the Spirit fell upon them. And so it's not that it's a necessary element of salvation. What he's doing here is he's connecting it. Um, they were familiar. I'm really chasing a rabbit here. They were familiar with the baptism of John the Baptist, which was a baptism of repentance. Uh, for the forgiveness of sins. And so he was connecting it with that. And he was saying, look, and, and, and here's the bottom line of what baptism is. Baptism is a response of a heart that has been made right with Christ. It's a response. And it is a sign. It is a sign that I have repented. That I have heard the gospel. I believe the gospel. I believe the truth. And I have repented and turned my life. And I am now following after God. And it is a visible sign to everyone around that that's what I am doing and that that's the decision that, that I'm making. Um, so Acts chapter 2 verse 38. There's some things about the Holy Spirit as I go on. I'm gonna, this is about the Holy Spirit. There's some things about the Holy Spirit that I just want you to understand. Uh, John chapter 14. And when I preached through John, I talked about these verses. In fact, some of these verses I preached on explicitly. You may not uh, really remember it. And so I just want to point some of these things out to you. Uh, really, 16 through 18 is the verse that I just want to reiterate right here at this purpose. I want you to understand uh, what Jesus says about, about having the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, 
Okay, he says, uh, verse, chapter 14, verse 16 through 18. I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. He's the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And then you can see some other verses down there. Uh, also in verse 26, uh, you can also see in, uh, I'm, excuse me, I'm sorry, verse, tw- yeah, verse 26. Then you can see chapter 15, verse 26. Then you can see chapter 16, verse 7, 8, 9 through 14. Uh, all of these things where he teaches, Jesus is explicitly teaching about the Holy Spirit. And here's, here's sort of the basis. Here's sort of the foundation of, wh- of what he's saying. It is Christ in you. The Holy Spirit of God is Christ living in you. He's sent by the Father in the name of Christ. He's sent by the Father because of Christ he's sent by the Father after Christ has ascended into heaven and he comes into our lives and he lives and he takes up uh, residence inside of us if you read all of those, those verses you will see that the Holy Spirit he is our guide he is our teacher and he is intent upon glorifying Christ he is the one that guides us in our life he gives us uh, the spiritual wisdom to guide our lives that we need he teaches us Jesus in those verses talks about how he teaches everything uh, that Christ taught he teaches everything everything, all the things of Christ. He teaches us the things of God, the ways of God, and the will of God. And his sole purpose is to glorify Christ. So if I'm going to glorify Christ, the Spirit of God inside of me will be glorifying Christ through me. So we're going to be talking today about being filled with the Holy Spirit. First, I want to talk about about this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all right? So you've probably heard that little phrase before. I'm going to get over back over in Acts chapter 2. You've probably heard that phrase before. Jesus used the phrase one, maybe one time, John the Baptist, and really, there are really two, and there are two, I don't know what I want to say. There are two, I, I can't think of the word. I hate it when I do that. Uh, there are two scenarios in which, only two scenarios in the Bible in which this phrase, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, comes up. Don't be afraid of it, all right? Uh, So Jesus says, I'm going to use the words of Jesus um, back over here in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. He says, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus told them, he said, look, and he's referring to the day of Pentecost when it comes. He's told them to stay there in Jerusalem to pray. Uh, He said, now John baptized you with water. And he's saying, but listen, in just a few days, you are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In fact, many, most of the passages uh, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, that have to do or use, put the phrases baptism of the Spirit together, they're all spoken by John the Baptist. And uh, let's see, let me just pick one out here. I think I gave you uh, several of them. Um, let's just pick out Matthew 3.11. I hope that's one. No. Uh, But they are all in reference to John the Baptist speaking to his followers. And so in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, he said, John the Baptist, he says, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So this idea, the New Testament idea of being baptized with the Holy Spirit comes from John the Baptist. He told told his disciples, he says, listen, I'm baptizing you with water. Uh, It's a water baptism to repentance. He says, but listen, there is one coming after me. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so then Jesus comes on the scene. He gives all those words that we talked about and just read a second ago in John chapter 14 about how he's sending the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 1, uh, right before he ascends into heaven, he says, you need to wait here. And in just a little while, you are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Baptized with the Spirit. There's only one other place in the Bible. There's only one other scenario in the Bible where this terminology of being baptized with the Spirit um, is used. And it is in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. And the reason I'm doing this is because... um, I don't know, that phrase, baptism of the Holy Spirit, has taken on a, 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 a meaning that's bigger than what's in the Bible. I'm just going to say it like that. It's taking on a meaning in our lives that, that we attribute to it that's really not scriptural. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. 
It says, as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being so are one body, um, also in Christ. So also is Christ. Verse 13 is the verse I really wanted. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. All right, so here's what he's saying here. And he's using this image. And if you read this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 12 on, uh, 1 Corinthians, um, what, 12? Yeah, starting 12, starting in verse 12 on. He's using this image of the body. And he says the church is like a body. And the, just like the body has different parts, the church has different parts. And so there in verse 13, he says, what happens is we, as the people of God, are baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. So let's just try to make it as simple as we possibly can. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is something supernatural and spiritual that happens inside of you. And what it is, it is making you a child of God. It is making you a part of the body of Christ. That is what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Now, there is a filling of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But these two things are separate. What you have on, in Acts chapter 2 is you have both things happening at one time. You have the coming of the Holy Spirit. So you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then you also have them being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, 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 together. They have being filled with the Holy Spirit. So both of these things are happening at the same time. Could I please get uh, the... uh, Down here. uh, It just helps me stay on track. Uh, Thank you. (laughs) Uh, But anyhow, so that's what... um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So every believer, here's, here's well, I, I, you need to get this. Every believer, the moment you surrender yourself to Christ, you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with, with anything outward. It has nothing to do with anything that happens to you at that moment. It is all internal. It is all what happens inside. It is all what the Spirit of God does to you as they make you a part of the body of Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, he says this. He says, in him, talking about in Christ... You also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise uh, of his glory. So this verse is really telling us that what happens is when we become the people of God, God sends His Spirit. When you become a child of God, God sends His his Spirit to live inside of you. In fact, this verse says that He seals you. He seals you with His Holy Spirit. Again, this has nothing to do with power, which I believe the filling of the Spirit, and we're going to get to the filling of the Spirit in a minute. But this doesn't talk, this is not about power. This isn't about uh, any kind of doing anything. This is only about what God has done What God does inside of you the moment you become a believer and the moment you surrender your life to Christ. He seals you. He baptizes you with the Holy Spirit and it is His seal. It is His seal upon you. It is His stamp. He has sealed you uh, with the Holy Spirit of promise. It says at the end of verse 13. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Now when something was sealed back in those days or even in today... Um, so a lot of times you need something that needs to have that official seal on it, right? If you get a passport, it's got to have this official seal. If you get it, sometimes they want a birth certificate, it's got to be the one, right? With the official seal. The seal says it's genuine. The seal says that it's, that it, it, that it is, it is real. The seal says that, that it is confirmed, that it is authentic. God's seal upon you confirms that you belong to him. God's seal upon you, His Holy Spirit confirms that you are a child of God. That you are a genuine and authentic child of God. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with what you do. 
It has everything to do with what God did the moment you surrender your life to Him after hearing and believing in the gospel. You are sealed with that Holy Spirit. You are authentic and genuine. It also means, and actually I think it's Romans 8, 16. Uh, it says, the, seer, the Spirit bears witness with my spirit that we are, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That this, you know, it almost sounds sometimes arrogant when people are like, well, I know I belong to God. Well, how do you know? Well, trust me, it doesn't have anything to do with me, right? Trust me. Uh, if it had something to do with me, I wouldn't be too sure, okay? But because it doesn't have anything to do with me, because the Spirit is bearing witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. It is the Spirit of God, that seal that He has put on me, that baptism of the Spirit that He has given to me, that lets me know that I belong to Him. So it is confirmed authentic. It also means that you belong to someone. It's like, it's like a name tag. It's like a, a plate. It's like a stamp. It's like, this belongs to me. You know, we make a big deal in Revelation um, about Satan having this seal that he's going to put on people. And, you know, this sign, this mark that he's going to put on people. Let me tell you something. He's a copycat. Because Jesus had the seal first. God has the seal first. God has the mark first. God is marking you. This seal is God marking us as belonging to him. God marks his children. These are mine. These are mine. These have heard the gospel. They've been convicted in their hearts. They've turned their life and begun to follow me. Boom. Now they are mine. You are sealed by God. It shows uh, ownership. It's also kind of a, a, a security thing. You know, they put that, if you, if you read about the resurrection, when they killed Jesus, they put him in that tomb. It says that they closed, they rolled the door on the tomb. And it says that they put a seal on it. They put a seal on it to make sure that it was secure. I really don't know what this looked like. I don't know what it was, but there was some kind of seal that made it secure so that it could not be broken. Your seal is also secure. At the end of verse 13, it says, Whom, uh, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Listen, who is the guarantee. He is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. What that's saying is, the Holy Spirit in your life is your guarantee that you have God and heaven until He comes again and redeems everything that belongs to Him. It's your guarantee. It's the mark that you belong to Him. Listen, that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, alright? So, so I, I know it's easy uh, to get a little bit confused, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that internal spiritual thing that happens when God makes us His children and brings us into the body of Christ. And so Jesus baptized, uh, baptized and uh, they were filled at the same time. So let's talk a minute about fill, the filling of the Holy Spirit, all right? So we're still in Ephesians, so let's just go to chapter 5 and let's go to verse 18. Um, you're going to be a little, uh, I think you might be disappointed. Well, let me forget that. You can't be disappointed, right? Uh, chapter 5, verse 18. So it says, Do not be drunk with wine, which is uh, dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So there are some things here that I want to talk about. Uh, and I'm picking out this one verse, but it's in a whole context uh, of Paul writing about being filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's, here's one thing I want you to point out at first. This is a command. All right, it's a command. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. There is never a command to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the baptism of the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with you. All right? It has nothing to do with you. It has only to do with the work of God. This is a command. So this suggests that I need to take control here. So he is commanding you to be, uh, to, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that this is not only a command, but this is also continuous. Now, we don't really see it here. But as the baptism of the Holy Spirit was one time that happened to every person the moment they became a believer, this is something that, that happens over and over and over again. So, so Greek grammar is a little bit different than English grammar. Cody, I knew, I knew I could look at Cody and get something going there. It's a little bit different than English grammar. So, you know, our grammar is pretty simple, past, present, and future. And the, the way we use the word is either past, present, or future. 
Greek grammar is a little bit different. It, it talks about what kind of action it is. Um, and let me do it like this. For those of you who've been around church a long time, you've probably heard a sermon asking it will be given to you, uh, seeking you'll find, knocking the door will be open. And have you ever heard in a sermon or in teaching like that that it is saying, keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking? Have you ever heard that? Right. It's because of the tense of the verb in the Greek language that shows a continuous action, an action that is ongoing and it keeps going and it's continua- continuating. Continuing. Continuating is not a word. That's the same Greek verb tense that's used here in Ephesians about be filled with the Holy Spirit. Literally, you could translate this as keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. It is a continuous action. It is something that has to happen over and over and over again. It is sometimes we can grieve the Holy Spirit. There are sometimes we can just, we, we can't never push the Holy Spirit out of our lives, but we can lock Him in a room, right? And we can not let Him have any control over our lives, and we can not let Him have His way in our lives. So this is a command uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's a command that's something that's supposed to happen continuously uh, on and on. So I want you to also see the contrast here that He makes. The contrast is what helps us to understand uh, what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So He says, do not be uh, drunk with wine, which is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right. So what he's doing here is he's making this contrast between being drunk and uh, being filled with the Spirit. Now, I know none of y'all in here have ever been drunk. I know that. I know that for a fact. So I'm just going to explain it to you. All right. I'm just going to tell you kind of a little bit about what it means. So listen, well, look at it like this. Peter, when Jesus was arrested, stood around a fire and was afraid of, of a young slave girl because she accused him of being a follower of Christ. And he publicly and, uh, said that he didn't even know Jesus. Well, after the Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter 2, Amen. Peter gets up with all boldness in front of thousands and thousands of people who had flooded to the city And suddenly, not only is he willing to say that he's a follower of Christ, he preaches one of the boldest sermons that he could have ever preached. So he went from, you know, and so that's this idea behind, you know, what, you know, just trust me on this. They don't call it under the influence for no reason. Because when you are under the influence, it is because something else is influencing you. You will say things you wouldn't normally say. Take my word for it. You will say things you wouldn't normally say. You will do things you wouldn't normally do. The shyest person can suddenly become this big boisterous person and actually a little bit obnoxious if you want to know the truth and you'll wish they would go back to being shy again, right? But, but you understand he's making the point here. Being under the influence of something else He said, what we need to be is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so what he's saying is, just like alcohol can kind of control your life, it can kind of take over, it can make you do things you wouldn't normally do, it can make you say things you wouldn't normally say, it can give you sort of this false bravery that you don't normally have. He's saying, guess what? The Holy Spirit can do the same thing. The Holy Spirit can give you this bravery where you're usually timid. The Holy Spirit can put words in your mouth where you usually don't know what to say. The Holy Spirit can take control of you. In fact, he's saying this is what needs to happen to us. We need to continually, daily, moment by moment, all through the day, continually give ourselves to allow the Holy Spirit to have control of our lives. And that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. So he says, be filled with the Spirit. It is that command, it is something that we do, it is something that we do continuously, and it is something where we allow the Holy Spirit to have control. So, um, how do we do that? I don't know if I made a slide for this one. I can't believe I didn't make a slide. Wait a minute. Well, I did it right there, didn't I? I did it on that slide. How do we do that? I mean, how do I give my, how do I make sure that I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to fill my life? How am, I, how am I making sure that the Spirit can fill my life so that I can 
so that I can be filled with the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and do the things that the, that the Spirit wants me to do. I'm, I'm just going to get... The, and listen, I realize that the subject of the Holy Spirit is huge. And I could never simplify it really as much as I'm trying to simplify it today. Um, and, and actually am simplifying it today. But I just want to give you a little something uh, practical that you, can, that you can hold on to. So first of all, the first thing is just understand the truth that, that I've just taught to you. Understand that, the, that, understand that if you belong to God, you have the Holy Spirit in your life. That you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your life and He indwells you and He will be with you, as Jesus said, forever. It is never ending. So just understand that truth uh, that the Holy Spirit is there and He's inside of you. So now how do we begin to let the Holy Spirit have, have control of our lives? Romans chapter 8, verse 5. So in Romans chapter 8, He's talking about living according to the flesh and living according to the Spirit. I think verse 5 is very enlightening uh, if, if you just let it, let it be. He said, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. This is almost too simple, right? You see, we've built this Holy Spirit thing up to be something incredibly incredible. But it's almost too simple. He's saying this. If you live according to the flesh, it's because your mind is focused on the flesh. He said, but if you want to live in the Spirit, and if you want to walk in the Spirit, and if you want to allow the Spirit to guide you, then you need to focus your mind on the things of the Spirit. You need to set your mind, well, as he says in, in Colossians, set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. We need to take our minds, we need to take control of our minds. We need to take control of our minds. Um, man, it's just crazy, isn't it? Um, you want to get still. You want to get quiet. You want to, you just like, I'm going to have me a prayer time with God. And it's going to be a good one. And the kids are gone. And the dog's outside. I turned off all the TVs. I've lost my phone. So I'm going to sit down and I'm going to be quiet. And I'm going to spend time with God. That mind starts going crazy, does it not? Does it not? It starts going crazy. Some of the most ungodly things will come into your mind when you are trying to pray. Yes or no? <laughs> Thank you, okay. <laughs> I didn't want to be the only one. <laughs> no. Uh, um, um, we need to take control of our minds. And the way we need to do that is we need to start building the environment of our minds. He said, those who walk in the flesh set their minds on the things of flesh, but those who walk in the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. We need to begin to fill our minds. We need to begin to fill our lives with the things of God. Obviously, it comes through God's Word. It comes through reading God's Word. It comes through taking it into our lives. It comes through actually talking to God. It comes through, you know, he talks in, in Corinthians about taking our thoughts captive. We need to just take our minds captive. Here's something that, that I felt like, um, you know, I, I, when I've been talking to you about prayer, I've been talking to you about triggers and let things trigger you to prayer. Uh, let me, how about we do that? How about you do this? Try this. I dare you. I'm going to try it. Every time your mind starts going, you know, and you start getting those vengeful thoughts or those mean thoughts or whatever those thoughts are that are coming in your mind that you know are wrong, how about you let that trigger you to pray? How about you let that trigger you to say, ooh, I better start praying. You know, I always tell people if you can't sleep, just start praying. And I mean really praying. You'll go to sleep in no time. Satan don't want you praying. He ain't going to keep you awake. Every time some bad thought comes into your mind, if it drives you to your knees and if it drives you to an intense time of seeking to be close to God, he might stop bringing those things into your mind because he knows where they're going to take you. They're going to take you to seeking God. 
We got to take those thoughts captive. We got to take our minds captive. We got to take our lives back from the world. We've got to take our lives back from the enemy. And we got to start setting our minds on the things of God. Uh, Luke eleven thirty four. 34. Um, I think Jesus says there, the lamp of the body is the eye. And so if, if, if the eye is good, your body will be full of light. But if the eye is bad, your body will be full of darkness. I believe that's what it says. Uh, the, we got to be careful what we see. We got to be careful what we look at. We've got to, if we are serious about wanting to experience the empowering and the guiding and the leading of the Holy Spirit, then we're going to have to be serious about taking control of our lives, taking control of our minds, and taking control of the environment that we build in our lives. Whether or not we're going to be thinking about spiritual things and the things of God, or we're going to have our mind on the worldly things and the things of the world. Uh, one more thing that, that, that we do. Um, Romans chapter 6, since we're right there, verse 13. He says, present your members as instruments of unrighteous... Do not present yourselves... Um, all right, let me start over. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Surrender. I'm calling this one surrender. And here's what he's saying. And, and he, in, that, in that passage there, he's, he's talking about uh, how, we, how we live to God and how we yield to God so that the Spirit can take control of our lives. He says, first and foremost, or not first and foremost, that's my word. But he says, here's what you need to do. How about you just give yourself to God and let God use you for his purposes? How about instead of giving ourselves to all of these other things, how about we give ourselves to the Lord? How about when I wake up in the morning, I don't just say, God, bless my day. God, just bless my day. How about I say this? God, use me today. How about I say this? Lord, I'm putting myself into your hand today so that you can use me however you want to use me. I'm going to be your tool today. How about I surrender myself to the ways of God? How about I surrender myself to God himself and give myself to him for him to use, for him to actually use? Because here's the deal. When you start letting God use you to accomplish his purposes and his ways, the spirit is going to fill you up and is going to begin flowing through you and is going to empower you to do exactly what it is that God wants you to do. So keep on being filled with the Spirit. Keep on setting our minds and our eyes on Him. Keep on being conscious of Him and keep on surrendering ourselves to Him. Go ahead and stand up with me if you would. Um, look, I really, I really took a huge subject and probably didn't do it very good justice as I tried to really simplify it. But as a church, as a people of God, together as the church of God, who are called to glorify God, to go and be obedient to His commission, and to gather together, and to go together, and to glorify together, we can't even begin apart from the empowering of God's Holy Spirit. We can't even begin apart from God's Spirit being in our lives, and then from us yielding to His Spirit and allowing His Spirit to have control over us. So today, I'm asking us where we stand in that regard. Um, we require the Holy Spirit, all right? We require Him in order to do the things that God truly wants us to do. And so now we've got to submit and surrender those things to Him. We're going to sing. If you need to come forward for any reason, you can. If you'd like me to pray with you, I'd love to. If you want to come and pray on your own, you can. Uh, anything that you need to do uh, this morning you come uh, while we sing together come in.